you to open up your copies of the scriptures to Ephesians chapter 1. We'll be reading Ephesians chapter 1 verses 15 through 23 for our sermon this morning, uh, but the sermon will only focus on the first part of that passage. In addition to generally reading a little bit more scripture so we have context when we consider a passage, uh, we're also reading this whole scripture because just like the last two sermons in the Greek, it's all one massive sentence. And so it's appropriate that it always be read together. Let's take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word, for your kindness in revealing the way to salvation to us in it, for your love to us by providing it to us so that we could not just know of you, but be your people and see what it is that pleases you and how you desire us to live. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit among us, enliven our hearts and our minds, that we would be able to see wonderful things in your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at, the right hand in, at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Now it's easy for us as Christians to take a lot of pride in what we have done or can do or might do for other believers, to think that we have done it, we have accomplished it, and we kind of get discouraged when we say, well, all I can do for you is pray. Maybe we are far away from one another. Maybe we are ill. Maybe age or infirmity have made us unable to physically help in the ways that we have in the past. And this is a problem, brothers and sisters, that we look down on prayer as something that isn't powerful, that isn't mighty, that isn't great, uh, that the opportunity to have the God of the universe step into another person's life and act is somehow less than us coming. And so while it is good and important that we should help each other physically as much as we're able, I mean, remember James warns people who say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but don't take any action for them. We also want to remember just how amazing it is that our God hears our prayers and that he answers them, that he acts in other people's lives because of our asking for it. Now, Paul here establishes for us a beautiful balance between prayer and praise. We just read the longest coherent sentence in the New Testament, all of praise, and now we have the second longest, and it's all prayer. And this is a balance we should seek for. When we are coming to God, we may have a tendency to spend more time praising him, more time singing hymns and singing uh, his praises or speaking of his praises and his goodness. And those things are good, but we also need to seek his face. On the other, times, at, on the other hand, at times we may have a tendency to pray a lot more than we praise. We come to God and we kind of just have a laundry list of things we want to ask for, and that's all we see praying as. But Paul gives us a good balance here, mixing prayer and praise, one and then the other, both in exhaustive measure. Now, as we look through Paul's prayer here, we're going to see an example of praying for other believers. In verse 15, we will see some reasons to pray for other believers. In verses 16 and 17, we'll see the nature of prayer for believers. And then verses 18 and 19, we'll see the desired work of the Spirit in believers. So first of all, verse 15. 
Reasons to pray for believers. This is what Paul says. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love toward all the saints. So Paul lists two things there, their faith and their love. And these two things are not massively special things that make the Ephesians different from any other church, that they have faith for God and love for the believers. It's actually a common thing that's basic to all Christians. Faith in Jesus and love for his people are what define Christians as Christians. We're asked in the scriptures, how can you say that you love God if you don't love your neighbor who's made in his image? And so loving God basically requires a love for his people as well. Now, what is this faith that we're professing that they have? Uh, It's simply an exclusive trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's faith in the right person. It's not that they've achieved a certain level of faith, that they are greater in faith than other churches, so Paul remembers them. It is that they are exclusively trusting in Christ alone for their salvation. They've recognized themselves as sinners. They've turned to him, repented, and are now resting in him. And then out of that faith, they have love for the brothers. This is active. It's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. It's not warm and fuzzies when you're around other Christians, although that may be there. It is a decision to act lovingly toward other believers. Now, as we consider these as the reasons to pray for other believers, we kind of have a reason to pray for every believer that we ever think of, because every single believer has faith in God and has love for the brothers and sisters. And this opening to Paul's prayer is not just a reason, but it's also something to ask that God would continue. Um, We see that for the Ephesians, especially because when you get to the book of Revelation, which was written decades later, love has passed out of the church. It is gone, and they are still going through the motions. They're still doing the right things, but, but there's no heart in it. There's no desire for the good of other Christians. They've given up the warmth of their faith for just the outward reality. And so while we have these as reasons for praying for other believers, that we should pray for all of them. We also want to, before we get into anything else, ask that God help them to continue in those things, that as he promised, he would cause his people to persevere in them all the way to the end. But with these reasons for praying, we're going to look at the nature of prayer for believers in verses 16 and 17. Paul says, I do not cease to give thanks for you Remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. So first of all, we have the timing of prayer. When does Paul say that he is going to pray for these believers? He doesn't say next Tuesday or next month or when I get to it on my schedule uh, in a couple of years, I will be praying for you. But he says, without ceasing, I am praying for you. And this isn't saying that Paul doesn't take a moment to breathe or to pray for anyone else or that he doesn't uh, do anything that involves his mind that isn't prayer. It is saying that Paul doesn't stop doing it. He doesn't say, all right, I've prayed for the Ephesian churches three times now. I'm done praying for the Ephesian church. They'll be fine. Uh, But it's a progressive, continual, regular thing he does. He brings them to the Lord as often as he remembers them. Notice also the direction of his prayer. He is praying to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. He is directing his prayers to the Father. And as all persons of the Trinity are truly God and have the rights to all the prerogatives of the Godhead, it is not inappropriate to pray to any member of the Trinity But it is most appropriate to pray as Jesus did and as his apostles gave us direction, directing our prayers particularly to the Father. And as we look at this, he's praying to the Father of Jesus Christ regarding the sending of the Spirit. We have here another Trinitarian passage. We had one in the last verse where it brings Father, Son, or last sentence, where it brings Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. And here also we see Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so while we don't have the word 
Trinity in the scriptures. The Trinity is something that is clearly taught by our scriptures, and we have before us another reason to believe in the Trinity, to believe in a triune God, as we professed earlier. And so Paul is praying regularly, constantly, whenever they come to his mind, and he is praying to the Father on behalf of the Ephesian church. But he also gives some content to his prayer. First he says, I do not cease to give thanks for you. And then he says, remembering you. And this isn't just saying that he remembers them and then prays, but this is specifically making remembrance of them before the Lord or making mention of them. And then lastly, it says that he is uh, praying that the Father would send the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So first of all, he is giving thanksgiving for the Ephesian church. He was able to be there and minister among them and live among them for a time. He knows their faith, but it's not just that he knows it personally himself from seeing it, but he hears that they're continuing in their faith, and so he praises God. And that is a great thing for us to do on behalf of other believers. When good things come into our life, we most certainly should go to God and thank him for it. But also when he pours out blessings on our brothers and sisters, it is good for us to take that before the Lord our God and thank him for it. Not only is it just appropriate that we see God's good and we recognize it, but also it will stir up our hearts to love and more easily enable us to love our brothers and sisters outwardly and in our hearts when we take time to thank our God for how he has provided for our brothers and sisters. But then secondly, he says he makes remembrance of them. He knows them, and he calls them to mind before the Lord his God. This calling to mind isn't just a cognitive saying, you know, I know that you're there, and I know God knows you there, and so I just mentioned, hey God, they're there. This is calling to mind their troubles, their struggles, their needs, the ways that they are suffering in this life, and bringing that before the Lord his God. And these are things, it's not that God doesn't know what's going on in other believers' life. It's not that he doesn't care what's going on in other believers' life. It is that we love them and we want our God, our Father, to act. And as we do this, as we come in between our brothers and sisters' trouble and the Lord our God and intercede for them, we're actually imitating Christ who his main job right now, since he was resurrected and ascended to heaven, and until he comes and calls us back to him, is sitting at his Father's side and doing the same thing for us, calling for his Father's mercy and love and grace and kindness to be showered on us. And so when we know a brother or sister has a struggle, a trouble, whether it's health, whether it's age, whether it's family troubles, whether it's problems at work, or anything else under the sun, we can bring those things before our God and ask for him to act. Ask for him to act according especially to his, beha- to his character. Because God loves to be reminded and argued with according to his character, that his people would demonstrate an understanding of who he is and what he does and ask for him to do what he has promised. He loves it when his people know him and speak not as strangers who are far off, but with, as those who are acquainted with him. And so when we pray for someone who is sick, uh, we've had a few people connected to the church who've had strokes recently. We don't say, God, we know you're all powerful, so just do something. We say, God, we know you are the one who heals who brings not just spiritual but physical healing to people, that there is no healing on this earth apart from you giving blessing to the means that people try to use. So please, God, our healer, be active. And so as we seek the face of God for our brothers and sisters, we want to remember who this God is that we're seeking and remind him that we know. Not because us knowing it gives us any kind of power, but it draws us nearer to him, recognizing him for who he is as a loving God and not one who is far off. Then thirdly, Paul prays that the Father of the Son would send the Holy Spirit. 
Specifically here, he calls him the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now this wisdom and revelation, these are some of the things that the Holy Spirit does. He brings wisdom and guidance. He reveals the Son and the Father to us, especially bringing to our minds things that we knew about them and have forgotten. But this isn't the whole of what the Spirit does. The Spirit also regenerates hearts and gives them an interest in Christ to begin with. He also uh, continues to draw Christians back to the Lord, not just revealing things and making them known to them, but also applying them to their hearts. And so this here calling the Spirit, the Spirit of wisdom and revelation is what literature people call metonymy, and I have to look it up every time, but it basically means referring to a small part of something as the big part. So in the Old Testament, uh, someone, one of the prophets said, Lord, you have made my ear. Well, yes, he made your ear, but he also made the all of you. Uh, It's referring to a small part to refer to the big part. And so here we're referring to the Spirit as the Spirit of wisdom and revelation because those aspects are particular to what Paul is going to be praying for as things go on here. But it's also not asking for those exclusively. It's asking that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on this church, that he would be living and active among them, and that he would be giving them what they most need. And in this case, this wisdom and knowledge are particularly, it says, rooted in the knowledge of him. That is the knowledge of Jesus We all read our scriptures. We all have times we've heard stories about Jesus. We know who Jesus is in our heads. But I'm guessing none of us have memorized all of the Gospels. And I'm guessing even if we had, we wouldn't have fully applied it to our lives. And so we need the Holy Spirit to work and expose us to the knowledge of God. Not just a head knowledge, not just a assent to facts, but to an inward and full experience of him. Having seen him work, we know him. Having become intimately acquainted with him, we know him differently than anyone who could just quote a verse or two about him. So as we consider this prayer that Paul was making, that he's making it ceaselessly, that he's praying to the Father, and he's doing all of these things, asking, thanking the Lord for the Ephesians, that he is remembering their needs and asking for the pouring out of the Spirit, and he's doing these things ceaselessly, we need to consider, how is your prayer life? How often are you seeking the face of God? Not just for yourself or not just when you get into traffic and say, Heavenly Father, you know, please help me with this traffic or make it go away, but bringing the needs of our brothers and sisters before him. Taking time to remember those that he loves and died for. If you're like me, it's always not enough. Thanks be to God that he doesn't accept us for our works or doesn't answer our prayers for our faithfulness, but because of his, though. Now, as Paul has been praying for this church, Uh, He asks specifically that the Spirit would be working in several ways in verses 18 and 19. Those verses say, Having the eyes of your heart enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believed, according to the working of his great might. Now, first of all, He says that the eyes of your hearts have been enlightened. That is, the Holy Spirit has already done his work. He has brought illumination into your life. He has regenerated your heart, and now you have an interest in the things of God. And he refers to here the eyes of your heart. That's that's the perception of your inward being. The heart in uh, modern America especially, we think emotions. Heart means emotions. But heart in Greek and in the ancient world wasn't just about emotions, wasn't just about feelings. It was the seat of and the source of your entire inward life. Just like your physical heart provides life and vitality to your physical body, 
Your inward heart is what provides life and vitality to your entire spiritual life. So it includes your emotions, but it also includes your reasoning. It includes your understanding, the depths of your soul, your motivations, your will. All of those are included in your heart. And so he wants the eyes of their hearts, the perceptions of their inward being to be enlightened and opened. Now, as we talked about and heard a bit in the confession of faith, God doesn't reveal himself as he used to. He used to come in dreams and voices from the sky and speak to people uh, and give special revelation to individuals to be provided to the church. And now we have the scriptures, everything that the Lord wanted for the church codified for us. And so the Spirit doesn't come and give wisdom and revelation or enlighten the eyes of our hearts in new ways to see things that no one has ever known before about God. He brings the words of the scriptures to life for us. I don't know if you've ever done devotions and you know you're behind and you've got a lot of stuff coming and so you just pass your eyes over the words and maybe read them in your head and then you say a quick prayer and then you're off for your day. Uh, you've taken the words of God into your mind at least a little bit, but there might be nothing going on inside because of them. The Holy Spirit makes a difference in our reading of the word. He brings them to life. And it is good for us to meditate and think and dwell on them and ask specifically that the Lord our God would enlighten our eyes as we read his scriptures, as we seek to obey his scriptures, as we seek to apply them to our lives. But the Holy Spirit isn't limited by our actions either. When we do that kind of reading, it's entirely possible that when we come to something in the day, the Holy Spirit will pull something that we read carelessly to our minds and enable us to glorify the Father by obedience, by remembering him. But just because God is gracious and kind and rewards us higher than we deserve, we don't want to expect that and lean on it and take it for granted. We want to remember the work of the Holy Spirit and ask for it. <clears throat> Now, beyond having their hearts enlightened, Paul specifically asks for the Ephesian church to have knowledge of three things. First of all, he wants them to have knowledge of the hope to which they've been called. He wants them to have knowledge of the riches of the glory, I'm sorry, of the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And then lastly, he wants them to have knowledge of the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. So this knowledge, again, uh, biblically speaking, knowledge is never just assent to a fact, okay? It is always tied to a deeper understanding of something. Um, and you see this at the very first mention of knowledge with Adam knowing his wife and babies coming after. It wasn't that he cognitively knew he had a wife and that created children, but there was more involved in knowledge than mere head thoughts. And so as he's asking for the church to have knowledge of these things, it's not just that they would know in their heads that they're true or that they would be able to give, you know, three points of things to say about this fact. It's that they would intimately and fully know in the depths of their soul that these things are true and that their lives would be guided by them. And the first thing he asks that they would know is the hope to which they have been called. This is the call of God on every Christian. This is the start of the Christian life. This is when he applies the word to our hearts and changes us and makes us into his people. It gives us a hope. And that call of hope gives us Motion gives us direction, gives us a pull toward several things in our life. First, toward Christ himself, toward the Lord Jesus who we hear in the gospel and we throw ourselves on. It's also a call to holiness that we would be conformed and made like Jesus Christ. It's a call to freedom. It, the gospel isn't a, hey, trust in Christ and then do works and then you will have earned your salvation. It is, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so God 
gives us the holiness we need. He gives us freedom from the bondage of sin and from any attempts to earn his favor and gives us peace with himself. And to that point, we're kind of thinking, you know, Christianity is great. It's nice and easy. Why doesn't everybody do it? But it is also a call to suffering. Jesus told us as believers, we will have suffering in this life. We will have trouble. The servant is not greater than the master, and the master lost his life to the trouble that was given. In addition to having to suffer through being with sinners the 30-some years leading up to it. And so we as believers are called to suffering. Not pointless suffering, never, never pointless suffering, but suffering that the Lord uses to teach us obedience, to glorify himself in our lives, to try us, and sometimes to purge us of sin, that he disciplines us using the trouble and the suffering that come into our life. But ultimately, all of that suffering is also a call to glory, that we've been counted worthy to serve and to suffer alongside our master. So it is a call to be with him in this life, but ultimately one that continues to the end of that life. And that's where the next line picks up. He also prays that they would have uh, knowledge of what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That's the end of the Christian's earthly life. That's attaining unto heaven. That is the inheritance. We've been made joint heirs with Christ. And Paul points this out even when he's talking about Christians suing each other. He says, how will you who are going to be ruling in the next age submit yourself to people who don't even know God? Why would you do that? Instead, believers, deal with issues between yourselves rather than going to the courts against each other to sue each other to get physical wealth. Also, as being joint heirs with Christ, when we get to heaven, we will be made like him. When we see him as he is, not just through the eyes of faith, but with the eyes of our physical bodies and the immediate contact with him uh, that we have spiritually. And so these things are all what are laid up for us in heaven. We participate in eternal life now. We enjoy the benefits of our salvation now But Paul wants them to not just mentally understand that there are blessings coming, but to have true faith in it, to know it, to see them with the eyes of faith, and to lean on those things, looking forward to Jesus' return with faith and hope. Then lastly, he wants them to know the greatness of his surpassing power. And so we've seen the beginning of the Christian life, we've seen the end of the Christian life, and this is what's needed every day in between. Because if we're honest, every single day, thought, word, and deed, we mess up. We break God's law, sometimes in ignorance, and sometimes because we think we know better. But every day, from the first time we're called until the end, we need to know the greatness of God's power, to have it active in our lives, to have it keeping us near our Savior, and drawing us back to him, granting us repentance once again every day. Now, some people say there is nothing more dangerous than someone who thinks he knows where he's going. Um, But I would say that there's nothing more dangerous to the plans of Satan for a believer's life than a Christian know where he's from and where he's going and who it is that's holding him up in between. And so let's have faith in our God. Let's seek to have this knowledge and understanding of who he is, of what he's done in our lives and what he's doing. But above and beyond that, brothers and sisters, let's pray for each other to have that. Let's encourage each other in that. Jesus has already purchased all of the benefits for us. He has already treasured them up in heaven and all God needs is an excuse to act and pour these things out into the lives of believers. James reminds us, you have not because you ask not. And so, brothers and sisters, let's ask for these good things for one another and trust our good and loving God to deliver. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, you are a good God to us. You are kind beyond all measure and have good plans for us in this life and the life to come that we couldn't even fully wrap our minds around if you laid them out for us in a book. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the intercession of Jesus that even when we fail to pray for one another, that he is there seeking your face on our behalf. Grant us obedience, Heavenly Father. Help us to be more like Jesus. And as we fail, please remind us of the perfect place of rest we have in Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's now respond to God's word by singing hymn number 592, Jesus Bids Us Shine. Please stand for hymn number 592. Thank you. 